We're, we're in um, Washington, D.C. at the Selling Sickness Conference, and we are joined by Dr. David Healy, uh, professor of psychiatry in Cardiff, Wales, and the author of 20 books, maybe more, um, including the best-selling Let Them Eat Prozac. Um, but Dr. Healy's most recent book uh, is Farmageddon. And Dr. Healy, I, I wonder if you'd start us off by telling us the significance of your title. What is Farmageddon? Farmageddon refers to the fact that we're in a state of healthcare that's a approaching the climate change problems we've got, that we're at a tipping point, that if we keep doing the kinds of things we're doing, healthcare as we know it is going to be changed completely, and it may not be possible to get back. We're at a point where increasingly the healthcare system is delivering the wrong outcomes. It's leading to uh, earlier deaths and it's leading to disability rather than getting people out of bed and back to work and doing the things that they want to do. Wow. Can you tell us, you've, you've written many books, but Farmageddon is your most recent. What motivated you to write this book? One of the key things you need to know is it's not that recent. It was written about five, six years ago, but it took four years to find a publisher. No one wanted to publish it. Okay? So it's all about the fact that I could see healthcare changing beneath my feet. The way I want to practice medicine was changing the whole time. To the point now, in recent years, what's been happening is uh, I've been writing down, when I ha at the end of each year, I have to prepare a continuing professional development plan. I've got to outline my goals for the next year. And in uh, this plan for the last few years, I've been putting to avoid getting in the sack for practicing good medical care. Because increasingly, what I find myself doing is at odds with what the guidelines, you know, the standards of care say what you should do. Now, uh, the standards of care say the kind of things they say because they're captured by the pharmaceutical companies who are able to control the evidence. They go strike the articles, they ensure that those who are entrusted with trying to write uh, the guidelines, if they go by what appears to be scientific evidence, end up having to endorse the latest costly on patent product rather than the best product are the best way to treat people. Great. Now you have set up a website called Databased Medicine that's devoted to database medicine. No, the, okay. no it's actually called risk.org. Risk.org. R-X-I-S-K.org. This is our effort, or my effort, along with a few colleagues, to try and get to grips with the issues that, uh, that are outlined in uh, the book. We think the way around the problems we have at the moment is to get people generally reporting on things that may be going wrong on the treatment that they're on, and bringing a report to the doctor, by the pharmacist that's been handling their case, trying to get teamwork going, and uh, generally getting people back to a point where they can believe the evidence of their own eyes mm. uh, again, and where doctors listen to patients. Mm. We, we figure that if we can build that kind of database, mm. that we'll be in a position to counter the information that's coming through from the Right. Now, um, what would you like people to do as a result of reading your book? What do you hope would be some outcomes after reading well, Farmageddon? Reading uh, the book may lead to the excellent outcome of good sleep. You may fall asleep <laughs> quite quickly. But aside from all that, the key issue is if people uh, go into risk.org, um, if they're on pills, if they know anyone else who's on pills, and they may go into a report what appear to be fairly trivial problems like changes to your hair or changes to your skin and things like that, as opposed to just the fact that you've got a heart stuck in this pill or have been crippled by that pill. Because one of the things that's hugely overlooked in all this is, for instance, uh, changes to skin. When people think of a drug-induced change to your skin, you think of a rash or pimples and things like that, and you know we see photographs of all these things and even Doctors can't uh, actually distinguish one rash from the other. But really, these things are politically hugely loaded. If we have a drug that darkens your skin or lightens your skin, this is about as complex a political issue as you can get in the world today. So we're interested not just in the impact of drugs uh, in terms of the injuries they cause, but the impact on people's lives. Because drugs aren't designed by God to treat an illness. They're drugs that have an effect on you. They change all of us. They can, e they can do profound things to us. 
And what we're interested to do is to generally get people to let us know more about things these bills may be doing. Great. Now you have critiqued evidence-based medicine in your book. Yeah. Can you, you've in fact referred to it as a hydra that grows new heads with every effort to prune them back. Can you just explain further what you mean by that, evidence-based medicine as a hydra? There's a few things here. One of the obvious things is that evidence-based medicine as we have it today it refers to controlled trials being done to test whether drugs work or medical uh, uh, devices work. But these trials are all run by the pharmaceutical company that makes the drug that's under trial. And they hide the trials that don't suit them. They pick out the good bits of the data from the trials that do get published. They ghostwrite all the articles and they construct the evidence because they believe it's the evidence and not the free gifts, the free pens, the free uh, meals or trips to you know, the Caribbean that really influence doctors. And I think they're right. But beyond that, there's a deeper problem with evidence-based medicine. And it's... Beyond that, there's an even deeper problem. And it's the idea that controlled trials are the answer to everything. Even if industry had nothing to do with controlled trials and couldn't hide the data, even if we had access to all of the data from controlled trials, controlled trials, particularly within the mental health domain are not the answer to everything and they're in fact not particularly useful. The key thing that's going to keep you and me safe in terms of whether drugs work and they cause problems is the teamwork we can get out of a person working with the doctor or uh, the pharmacist or the nurse that's part of their healthcare team. That's where objectivity comes from. That's where we know what happens when we give a drug to you. Control trials, even if independent cannot answer these issues and arguably within the mental health domain really can answer very little. And what forces do you see as being most problematic in working against the provision of that kind of care at the individual level, at the, at the level of a practicing physician like yourself? The clearest forces are uh, you know, the pharmaceutical companies uh, who, as I've said, it, uh, run the trials and control to reduce the healthcare system that we have. But a further group of people are a lot of very well intentioned people who believe that evidence based medicine is one of our tools to control uh, the pharmaceutical industry and that all we need to do is to do decent controlled trials rather than have doctors and patients working closely uh, as a team. So there's a lot of good people who have no links to industry and no links to the regulatory apparatus who I see as being part of the problem also. I see. And tell us what you're working on now. Well, trying to get risk.org up and going. It's, this is the thing that I've been doing with colleagues for the last two or three years. It's been a huge amount of work. It isn't clear yet whether it's going to fly. It's a resource for people out there. We want to create the kind of situation where people who have an issue can find other people who have, to have, you know, um, have the same issue. Because we think it's not regulators and it's not academics and it's not companies who are going to solve the issue of does this drug cause that problem. It's people with the problem finding out that, well, yes, actually people in Washington, you know, when they're put on this drug, get this problem, their hair turns blue. But people in Baltimore, when they go on the drug, their hair isn't turning blue. Well, there's a lot of bright people who go on these pills. We think it's local people who are able to work out, well, this problem's happening here, but not over there. They're really going to be the people who crack open the problem of just what the drug is doing to cause that particular problem. We need to take these issues back into our own hands. Right. To create a very um, very much a grassroots kind of absolutely. system. Um, yeah. And the web is a great way to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Thank you so much for talking with us today. You're welcome.